everyone. Good morning. Um, thank you very much for inviting me to your conference. Um, my apologies that I cannot be there in person, um, but I join you here from a very rare sunny day in Glasgow. So I apologize if you can't see my uh, face quite fully. Um, I'll just uh, see if I can get the presentation up. Right. So, as I say, my name is Adrian Marishaw. I'm a Foundation Year 2 doctor in Greater Glasgow and Clyde in Scotland. And I have a particular passion based around mobile applications and more recently looking at ways of introducing gamification principles into medical education. For about the last year or so, I've developed a range of different medical apps, um, mostly for the iPhone platform. And it really all started after about five years of technological amnesia, um, where I had a simple laptop and I really stayed away from computers a great deal during my medical school course. Um, at the end of my final year exams, I finally invested in one of these, an iPod Touch, and the experience completely blew me away. Before medical school, I had a big interest in design and creation of different applications and programming, but I never thought I could actually apply to medicine. After using this device and seeing how intuitive it was and easy to pick up, the fact that you could have the internet available at all times, I knew that this was the way that we were going to be using computers in the future, and more importantly, how we might be educated by computers in the future. And I wanted to do something about that. So I went onto the App Store, and I saw a variety of different types of medical education apps. But unfortunately, on the most part, I was quite impressed by what I saw. From what I understand currently in medical education applications, is mostly taking MCQ databases or um, taking textbooks and simply transcribing them into an app that someone can download. They're not taking the, uh, making the best use of the medium, the fact that there's connectivity to the internet, the fact that we can multi use multimedia in these applications. And on the whole, I felt they were quite been designed and they weren't really taking this any more forward in terms of how medical education is actually delivered to us apart from introducing a computer screen instead of a textbook. So I set about to fix that. And I really wanted to really see what would happen if I could take the basic principles of medical education and somehow make the best use of this mobile medium, i.e. the smartphones, the tablet. And more importantly, I wanted to make this experience enjoyable to use. And that brought me to the question, if I could create an education platform that was of some sort of entertainment value, could I actually get medical students to engage, to engage with medical education on a recreational level? I felt that was a very intriguing question, because we engage with um, various types of games on a recreational level, we watch TV on a recreational level, but we don't really, well, for the most part, most people don't sit down with um, a question book and do that recreationally. So any additional time spent um, working or studying for medicine that doesn't seem to be a task or a hindrance surely must be an advantage. So I set about to see what I could do about this. And it really led me to two open ideas, test enhanced learning and gamification, which I'm going to talk about um, in just coming up now. So first looking at test enhanced learning. For those of you that aren't familiar with this concept, test enhanced learning I can best describe as the experience of teaching you get on a formal ward round, which is preferably my form of teaching. On a ward round, a senior clinician or a consultant would turn to me after seeing a patient and ask me, so what do you think is wrong with this gentleman? What is your differential diagnosis? What investigations do you want to start? What treatments might you want to start? What are the complications potentially? And what is his overall prognosis? It was a way of informal and slightly formal testing occurring on a daily basis. Within the space of one to two hours, I could have been easily tested on a variety, anywhere between 10 and 15 cases on a daily basis. And this is quite interesting because we don't really think of this as a testing process formally within medical education. And it's interesting because we mostly think of tests as a formative assessment that occurs towards the end of the medical year. 
as a way of testing the student's ability um, to actually recall information and apply it in a few assessments or at an OSCE type station. But what we don't really get out is that actually there's a lot of good research that shows that the act of being tested is also a form of learning. It's been shown in quite a few studies, including medical education um, and medical education um, publications, that where students were formally and informally tested um, multiple times, the actual ability to retrieve information um, was far, far higher. And the reason they fell for that was that the retrieval of the act of retrieval information is actually forming a type of neural network. It is getting the student used to actually applying all that medical knowledge they've spent so long acquiring into, in our um, case, a clinical scenario. And this effect is enhanced when there is repeated exposure to similar type questions or similar scenarios, and if there is relative and informative feedback at the end of these scenarios to show where a student's thinking may be misguided or in the cases where they're very good, reinforced. So in a sense, we're actually reinforcing good thinking behavior. We have an example of this in the United Kingdom already. Um, every qualified doctor and a student at the end of their five-year curriculum is asked to undertake an advanced life uh, support course. What these generally involve is a student or a group of doctors is sat with a facilitator and for the course of a day, a run through multiple advanced um, life support training scenarios, such as CPR or utilization of our resuscitation guidelines within the United Kingdom for a variety of scenarios that sometimes require pharmacological intervention and sometimes don't. And there's a good study from the Journal of Academic Medicine, which shows that over the long term, students and doctors who are exposed to this type of learning uh, multiple times over the course of years, that their recall of that information was far higher than those that simply were asked to attend a simple seminar um, or really asked to reset their uh, knowledge with a, a summative test. And in addition to that, there's a great deal of um, sort of studies um, applying test-enhanced learning to directly to medical education. There's evidence showing that where this process is used, i.e. multiple testing, students' recall of complicated knowledge, including pharmacology and pathophysiology, was actually very, very, um, was, the recall was very, very high. And this is interesting because we could technically use this to help a student or a doctor build a base of knowledge and from that um, help build their overall clinical expertise when they come to apply that knowledge um, in the wards. So, as I said before, there is a problem with this method, however, and the problem is this. A general medical school looks something like this, or at least my medical school looks something like this. On one side, you have the acquisition of knowledge, the seminars, the PBLs, the lectures, and the workshops. And on the other side, you have the actual ward bait experience, the time spent in the wards. Now, for an average medical student, in the course of a year, you might be assessed maybe just once on all that information you've recalled. But what test enhanced learning is telling us as a principal is for this to be effective, the student needs to be tested multiple times throughout the entire year. And effectively, that is a problem. And that's a problem because it's either not, uh, not um, financially feasible to do this, it may not have um, the required time for a medical school curriculum to actually involve a test testing program, and generally the <laughs> act of testing by students is seen to be an unattractive process altogether. And this is where the next idea comes in, and the next idea is gamification. So let me talk a little bit about gamification. Gamification is the concept of applying a range of game design techniques to non-game -application, non applications to make them more engaging. It's essentially the process of what turns your games that you play um, and what essentially makes those entertaining to use, psychologically analyzing them and trying to apply those same concepts to a non-game application such as education. 
And really what this, in my research, boiled down to was a few very key but overlooked things. The first of these, and maybe most obvious, is the use of attractive interfaces. It may seem quite obvious, but you'll find that a lot of educational apps or applications or computer simulation are very poorly designed and generally tend to be not very intuitive to use, um, can be quite difficult and will have a very uh, long learning curve, and as I said before, just not very pleasant experiences altogether. So if you can design something that's attractive to look at and easy to use, surely your user base is going to be more likely to want to engage with that medium um, on a voluntary basis. The other thing is to look at scores and achievements. Uh, people like feedback, whether that can be short or long-term feedback, and the use of scores and achievements is a great motivational tool, potentially. You can show a student how well they're performing um, or whether they want to perform particularly well in a single specialty such as car technology, and in doing so would give them some sort of achievement or virtual reward. And that can be a great and almost underused motivating factor that's actually heavily used by a lot of games today. Even pointless rewards in games such as collecting balloons um, can be seen as an obsessive type um, uh, um, reward strategy. So maybe we're not utilizing that enough just now. Additionally, and probably most importantly, story narrative. Story narrative is interesting because as clinicians, we're generally some of the world's best storytellers, in my opinion. Every day I go to work, and I'm having to tell five or ten different stories about a patient to my colleagues um, on a daily basis. And that's interesting because we don't really think of education or quick education as almost storytelling. Um, and it's quite important because if we can utilize storytelling or narrative correctly, we can create a sense of disbelief um, and immersion in our material. So in theory, possibly, if you could introduce an engaging story with your medical educational material, you could potentially increase the engagement time of a student in a series of multiple choice questions, perhaps artificially longer than if you just presented just the questions and some simple um, lines of dialogue to tie it together. So that's another thing to think about. The other thing was experience tracking. Fairly similar to scores and achievements, but probably a bit more relevant, uh, rele uh, rele um, relevant to particular specialties in medicine, in our case, for example. You can see how well you progress in a particular specialty and how long you have yet to go. Again, great for setting um, an objective. And lastly, um, competition is underutilized. Um, formerly in my medical school, or previously, what they used to do at the end of the year or at the end of the assessment, they would post the test results up on a wall and all the students in your year or class could see what score you got compared to their peers. Obviously now that process is anonymized and we receive our test results from the internet, but maybe there's something in competition. What if after completing a series of five different patients, I could upload my score potentially to my local classroom and see how well I compared it to my peers? That could be a great motivational factor for wanting me to repeat that testing process and achieve a higher level. Again, utilizing human psychology to improve engagement. <coughs> and there's a few examples of this really being used in um, um, other non-game applications. This is Like Plus. For what Like Plus essentially is, is a type of training application um, that allows users to record, for example, in this case, their running data, how far they've run, how long it took them, and where they've run. And upload that data to um, an online database that allows them to compare their data with other people in their local area. I already have a consultant in my place of work who uploads his cycling data and competes to another consultant um, in a different department on a daily basis. So again, this is a good um, example of gamification in use. And for close to the home in medicine, this is an example of a game um, that was used by the British Medical Association regarding the recent pensions um, 
reforms that are occurring in the United Kingdom just now. There is a campaign to see um, if we can try and change our pension. Um, um, well, so, sorry, is it, um, I've lost my train of thought, I apologise. Um, essentially, the pension reforms happening in the United Kingdom just now, and there's a range of things that we would like our junior doctors to know. This game was created to show junior doctors directly how the pension reforms would affect their end of pension scheme. And probably a for format like this, where gamification technique and storytelling and narratives used might be more um, engaging than a simple white paper. And you probably would have more people as a result using it than actually reading uh, the, the, um, uh, the white papers or the emails that come through. So that's another example. And I like to think of this kind of like covert learning. We're trying to almost sneak learning under the covers as someone's enjoying their experience of going through a patient scenario. And it's the combination of these three ideas that's going to let us do it. Almost a form of enhanced learning. So coming back to this, let's abolish the end exam term paper and replace it with a mobile medium. Um, the smartphones and tablets speaks by medical students is on the up. And in my medical school, we'll, um, we have statistics that show about 60 to 70 percent of all students tend to own one of these devices. And it's great because it's a medium that's portable, personal, and we can directly push content onto that. There are examples of medical schools in the United States that introduce um, objective learning obje uh, material and co um, co um, coordination with their modular based teaching. So for example, um, a biology module might come with a series of online apps that the student must complete by the end of that module. So it's almost um, supporting the actual course itself. And if we combine that with test enhanced learning process and the engagement uh, criteria found in gamification, perhaps we can create an overall more enjoyable learning experience. And this is really what I set out to do. So let's take these ideas and show you what I first came up with. This is Ward Round. Ward Round was a project I started after my final year of education and was really based around the idea that my best form of teaching was done on Ward Rounds, where I would see a patient and that patient, I would be required to know a differential diagnosis, investigations, treatments, prognosis, complications, as well as a range of other things relating to that treatment. And really this application stemmed from a frustration I had with current um, MCQ, or multiple choice question banks. And the fact that with a multiple choice question bank, if I went to cardiology, I would be expected to answer a question about pericarditis, for example, and then that would swiftly move on to something such as endocarditis, or um, a congestive heart failure. There was no holistic way of looking at a single case, and I thought that was a mistake. I thought, felt that there was nothing really looking at how we can deal with patient case scenarios in their entirety. And if we could put that together, that would probably be a much uh, better overall learning experience and would help our flow of thinking. So this is how it generally works. For example, you might be introduced to a clinical scenario such as this. Um, there are a few gamification elements here. Apart from the interface, there's also a timer element. The timer element is actually not that important, and I'm actually not really interested in timing students. It's just the fact that the time is there. And the fact there's a timer there is enough to make a student engage with that material probably far more intensely than if there was no timer element. And that was quite interesting to see as well. So from our clinical scenario, as I said before, it kind of broke down to a few simple questions. So making a differential diagnosis, what risk factors were involved in this case, investigation we want to start, distinguishing symptoms of the case, and what potential treatments we want. And most importantly, after doing this, relevant feedback. I believe my colleague in the previous lectures have related to the importance of feedback, and I couldn't agree more strongly. And for, depending on how well you perform during the scenario, your feedback does change dynamically. Um, and it does give relevant feedback for each individual case. So 
For example, if you didn't get the two strongest risk factors for the scenario, it was stipulated the two strongest risk factors and why the number of the two strongest risk factors. And I think that's really, really important. And we continue to do that for um, just over 120 cases in this application, which has done quite well. And as I mentioned before, we introduced those gamification elements of scores and achievements. And we also introduced the element of online competition. In our application, every uh, 24 hours, we have a series of five different case scenarios which are taken to an online um, server. A student has one attempt every 24 hours to complete those five patients, and from that, a score is uploaded. Um, at the time of uh, doing this picture, that most people were putting down their institutions, but we've had people from Calcutta to um, London to Cardiff um, to Vancouver, um, all competing on this online competition, and it's a bit very rewarding to see, and it will be interesting to see how we can put this idea in the future. The application itself has been out for about over 10 months now, and it's done pretty much very, uh, very well. At the time of doing this, um, these pictures don't quite correlate up to date, but we've had just under 1,000 downloads um, all over the world. On average, there are about 200 people um, accessing our application at some time, and the medium time of use is between two to five minutes. So it seems that people are using this um, in their downtime, i.e. the time probably spent between lectures or maybe traveling on the tube or form of transport. And overall, we don't really have any formal uh, reviews by students, but we do have ratings from the App Store. And overall, we have 12 so far, which is quite good. Actually, I think it's probably the one of the medical apps uh, for education that's probably got the most <laughs> reviews. And overall, we've done very, very well by the looks of things. So that was quite enjoyable to do. And from that experience, we wanted to go and create some other applications. So very recently, we launched another application called the World Round Picture Quiz, which essentially is applying the same gamification elements um, but this time towards spot diagnosis. For this application, obviously there is an issue um, with taking images and copyright. So what we've done here, we've acquired images from the Creative Commons, which are essentially images related, um, released into the public domain and can be found on places such as um, uh, Wiki Commons. And we took those images, referenced them to their authors, um, released a free application with them in there. And for every scenario, there are about five different uh, spot diagnosis questions. And at the end, you get feedback on each one. And it's quite um, an enjoyable little application. It's done very, very well. But it's still early days, so we haven't got the full data for that yet. But it'll be interesting to see how that progresses in the future. But that's all well good. But I really wanted to show you this next thing. Now, this next thing is quite um, close to my heart. It's trying to take these elements of communication and push them even further. And one thing I was always intrigued about was virtual patients. I saw my first virtual patient about three years ago at an Amy conference in Glasgow. Um, there were the various presentations from um, King's College in London, um, the States, and a few other institutions, um, including private companies. And I really wanted to put my own take on this. Because although they were very good, and uh, especially the King's and George's College um, example where they've used dynamic patient trees um, and very, very comprehensive uh, patient scenarios, I was incredibly impressed by that. And I wanted to really try and just think of myself. So this is what I'm currently working on with Glasgow University. And this is essentially my version of virtual patient combined with test enhanced learning processes. So use of multiple chair, um, multiple choice uh, questions within a holistic learning environment, I, as I was saying before, uh, differential diagnosis, investigation treatments, etc. Combined with an attractive interface and almost augmented learning experience with looking through case notes and seeing patients on the ward and also combined with that relevant feedback for those questions. But most interestingly in this scenario is the introduce of narrative and storytelling. 
Um, from what I can see, virtual patients do do storytelling to a degree, in a sense that it links together a case scenario. I want to take that idea a bit further. For example, in our virtual patients, instead of reading a simple scenario at the start or a summative amount of text, you actually have to communicate directly with our virtual patients. So you have to pay very close attention to what the nurses are telling you, what your colleagues are telling you in the dialogue, and what the patients are telling you. Because you're not going to get a summative feedback of that, uh, you're not going to get that information back later on. You have to remember it and apply that when the questions come up. Which is sort of a different way of thinking about how we present these type of virtual patients. And it is quite interesting because overall that does increase engagement with the material. You have to continually pay attention, like in real life. So the development for this was quite um, interesting. I've used a piece of software called Multimedia Fusion. And essentially what the software allows me to do is create a very strong and comprehensive engine which we've named the Valve Engine. And on top of that is the ability to create virtual patients using a simple text editor. The text editor is really simple to use. Essentially what you do is you define what you want. Do you want a character to speak? Uh, or do you want a question that involves a picture? Or do you want a question that has two correct answers, etc.? You essentially script this into any text editing program, you save the file, and my engine actually reads it off the back end. There is no coding involved, only scripting of the patients. And this is imperative because for virtual patients to be created at the moment is a quite lengthy, difficult, and sometimes very expensive process. I've been able to achieve this all at very minimum cost, almost free of charge, and the actual creation process is very, very quick, and I can see results instantly. And more importantly, this engine can be exported to a range of different mediums, including Android, Windows 8 phone, and the Apple experience, as well as Flash on the internet and a standalone executor program. So it's really, really powerful. It can be exported to a range of different mediums at a simple click of a button. And I'm very, very uh, proud of this. And we're starting now to actually see the fruits of development, with it, which we'd like to demonstrate to you just now. I have a, how are you for time? <laughs> so, yeah, it's okay. <laughs> Okay. I don't want to make everyone late for lunch. Oh, apologies for that. So this was the first experiment that we came up with. This is called On Call. On Call um, essentially is taking our guidelines for hypoglycemia in Glasgow. Something that um, from our data showing us we're notoriously bad for um, actually treating. And my consultant and I decided to create a case-based scenario based on this. And this is kind of how it works. So let's begin a case. And here you can see you introduce two members of the team. And the members of the team actually speak to you in dialogue. So here's our professor saying hi. How are we getting on? He's a bit of a starting and we're a new member of the team. So he wants to ask us some simple questions just to get us uh, going. And you can really see this is a, probably a very, very attractive interface. It's quite fun to use. So in this case, for example, people without diabetes, hyperglycemia is usually defined as a laboratory version of what? So a lot of people actually say in this case, finger uh, prick blood glucose, so actually it's plasma glucose. And you get feedback based on that question as well. And I'll just quickly run through these very fast. I'm sure you get the idea. And mostly what these questions were pertaining to were the things that doctors were getting mostly wrong when treating hyperglycemia. And as the side develops, for example, my bleep goes off now. It's telling me, or the professor being told he's got an unwell patient in Ward 17, but he doesn't have the time to go and see him. So he's asked us to go and see them for him and give him a call afterwards on how we get on. So we shouldn't let him down. And then we'll introduce the two different patients. So let's take case one. Or in case, Mr. Crow. So... Case one, we introduce the nurse, and is quite happy to see us. So, explain the professor's already. And then we start getting an introduction to the pain. So, 58 year old gentleman with a chronic kidney injury has just finished his hemodialysis. Previous history of stroke, alcoholism, and type 2 diabetes mellitus. Fine when he came in, but 10 years ago he's like confused and disorientated. His observation has better notes, and she's about to go do a glucose check for us. Okay, that's great. So, let's go see our patient. So our patient's tucked up in bed, we can't really see what's going on there. He's not really talking to us very much. 
and he's got a headache and he's feeling a bit cold. Okay, so let's quickly examine him. So let's look for our notebook. You can see that the observations. Well, his, pulse, his blood pressure is low on the low side. Pulse is, oh, well, it's a bit up. His temperature is fine. And his glucose, oh, his glucose is 2.8, so it's a bit low. But when we examine him, he seems to be okay. So we're quite happy with that. So let's go and see. Okay, ignore the background. We haven't gone back in time. This was an experiment for um, some graphics we were working on. But um, there is essentially asking for what we like to do. So here we are. We're, we're diving into action. We've got um, our patient case. We've got our background. And now we've got to make decisions based on what information we have so far. So let's get some glucose. That seems like a obvious choice. And you can see here when I make a correct answer, there's this feedback. Um, feedback is simple here. Um, in the left-hand corner, you can see those stars set up every time you um, click the correct question. That's quite um, important because that's a form of uh, almost reinforcement, I feel, that it's almost a sense of nice little satisfaction when you get a question right. So what's the best way of getting glucose oral? And uh, you, you kind of get the idea. You can see I've done this a few times. So she's saying we sent some lab tests away, and we can run, we run through these questions, and essentially, I'll get to the end of these. So the patient's very happy. He's going to get back to his job as taxi driver. He's recovered, and that's great. And then we get a little report at the end, seeing how well we formed. And also another sort of motor factor we introduced here was that unless you put over a certain amount in the case, you can progress to um, some other cases. And that's essentially how this application is working now. Um, we haven't released it just yet, but um, it's sitting there waiting to be released. Um, but it's so unfortunately been sidelined by some other things we're getting on with just now. <coughs> Excuse me one second. Okay, my throat. <coughs> so how do we actually design these patients? Well, design is quite simple. Um, we first turn to our textbooks, and I open up my notebook. And for example, for something like chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, uh, as was alluded to earlier, I will go through my textbook, or I will go through the local guidelines for treating this particular problem, and I will extrapolate from there what the main teaching points are. For example, what do I want to know about the etiology? Um, what particularly about the diagnosis um, alludes to this uh, diagnosis? Um, what treatments are first line and second line, um, and what the complications are, such as in this case pneumothorax. Um, and if we do choose things like complications in our virtual patients, how do we deal with that, with that intermittently? So once I have that information, I start um, actually writing it into a flowchart. Now, as you were seen before, you can have dynamic flowcharts or linear flowcharts, where simply one thing happens after another. Um, it would be great to do branching case scenarios. So, for example, if I got a question wrong, it leads me down a completely different path to the patient and the outcome would be different. And with us, that's completely implementable. But I really wanted to focus on getting linear um, patient scenarios done first very well. And I mean, a lot just sort of dismisses linear cases as not very good for teaching, but I think you can do them really well um, to the degree where they can be good learning tools. And in fact, in some cases, I think where a case is pointing you along the right direction and telling you consistently that you're getting it wrong um, and which the right course to take is, um, that can be also a form of um, reinforcement of the correct uh, clinical management of a case. So maybe there's still hope for linear cases still, in my opinion. And once you've done that, sometimes, depending on the complexity of the case, I might storyboard it for for funsies. So um, this is my poor attempt at drawing and storyboarding it. Not essential, but and the end result is something that looks like this, as you've just seen here. But what's most exciting is something that's happening right now, in fact, um, something I'll be going later on to Glasgow, um, uh, Glasgow Medical School to do today. And that's actually putting this um, sort of software in the hands of students and faculty members. So Glasgow University approached me recently and asked if I would be interested in running a student-selected module course, which is a small course for students that runs for about five weeks um, on virtual patients. For example, right now in Glasgow University, we have nothing in the way of virtual patients or e-learning. 
they were quite interested in this project and I said okay. So in just under two weeks, in fact, yeah, just under two weeks, I was able to teach the students how the software worked and this is what they made for me. This is an application that will be released to Glasgow Medical School very soon and on the wider app store generally soon after that. And this is called microbiology. It's still a bit rough. But essentially what it is, is they found that with um, Glasgow Medical School, learning about microbiology was very poor. And generally when students try to apply the microbiology guidelines for Greater Glasgow and Clyde um, Health Service, um, it wasn't very good. So what we did here is we took the guidelines for antibiotic treatment in uh, Glasgow and we made it right into a clinical scenario, which was great because essentially what we could do with this application is as when the module for microbiology is running, we could have this application that students could download in their free time and see exactly how our guidelines could apply potentially to a clinical scenario. And not only that, we can augment that with additional learning material, um, such as pathophysiology, anatomy, um, as well as pharmacology, and a range of other things that could really enhance the overall learning experience. And what the students have done so far, I've created a variety of cases. We can start with one on cellulitis just now. And it's a bit more advanced than the last one you saw. So again, it's a similar thing as you've seen before. It's still a little bit of prototype. And here we have the option of asking questions to our patients. And we get any information depending on what questions we ask. And then we continue with the scenario. And that's what we're working on very now. It's a really, really exciting project and it's looking quite nice at the moment. <laughs> So, I'll let you know how we get on with that. And really, summing this up, it's really about trying to find how we can introduce electronic learning material between the traditional learning-based um, course with books and study time and seminars and lectures and actually spending time in wards applying this clinical model. Somewhere between these two ideas, there's a potential for electronic learning to actually implant and help with that application of knowledge process so that when we come to work in the wards, students' um, practice will be overall improved. And I'd like to thank some of my colleagues who've helped me develop this project over the last year. And thank you very much for listening to me. If you have any questions, I shall do my best to answer them. Thank you very much. Thank you very much again for the interesting uh, uh, lecture uh, and I ask my colleagues uh, if somebody has a question now. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, okay, may I ask you, uh, uh, first of all thank you for the wonderful lecture. I think that it has fit perfectly into the topic which we have here today. And uh, I'm wondering if you are basing your uh, cases on your real experience in the hospital or uh, if you are using the guidelines and theoretical books, if you can touch on, on this. No, absolutely. So the way the um, virtual patient scenario is designed, um, once we have the actual learning and um, achievements we want to get with our virtual patients, what we do is then um, we refer to the guidelines to make sure that we're, what we're teaching is correct and true and referenced correctly. Um, we also look at range of um, case examples which can be found, for example, in the British Medical Journal there's great patient um, cases every week. And so we get a lot of um, experience and feedback from that as well as my own experience and experience from my colleagues. After that, what we'll usually do is I'll go to my seniors in the wards, in the hospital, or to the medical school and ask for feedback on the patient case scenarios and say, well, does this really add up correctly? Does this make clinical sense? Um, and generally, it's using all those developments to actually create these cases. So that's generally how they um, come about. It's a mixture of all those things. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Thanks for the reply. 
Are there any other questions, please? Well, hi, and my name is Jaroslav Majnik. I'm from Košice in Slovakia. Uh, this is surely great work, and it takes time to develop the final product. My question is, you mentioned that uh, there are almost 20 uh, users that use the outputs at the same time. Are there any software or hardware limitation to use it? Let's sit down. Well, um, the software actually is very lightweight. I mean, in terms of you running on a computer, you really don't need a very powerful computer at all. Um, other software limitations, I mean, these run directly on smartphones and they're calibrated for essentially the minimum setting. So hopefully these should run without any problems with minimum specifications or anything like that. They're, they're pretty pretty robust pieces of um, software. Okay, thanks. Does that, does that answer your question? Okay. No, no, yes, 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 thanks. Thank you. Okay, are there any other questions, please? In the one more. Hi, Adrian, Martin Komenda from Osijek University. Just a simple question, do you have any feedback from students? Well, this is interesting because I'm going to get my first feedback today. Um, <laughs> uh, today we're running some, um, some one-hour sessions in the medical school on Thursday. They actually get the first proper feedback from students. Um, on what they think of this method of learning. And um, I think that's imperative and really important to know other, so we can have our further balance of this in relation to the course. So unfortunately, apart from the general feedback I have from users of our previous applications on the Apple App Store, I don't have any direct feedback from students just yet. But I will as of this afternoon. <laughs> okay, thank you. Then, then we will be very curious about the feedback you get. So I, I, I will definitely ask you through email. And now, if there are no other questions, I want to thank you once more for your time because we had a lot of testing sessions uh, before this uh, real <laughs> video conference session uh, took place here. So thank you once more again. Uh, say goodbye, say hi to Glasgow people and uh, uh, we look forward to another uh, possi uh, possible uh, occasion for a meeting. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much for having me.